Uh, thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to try and talk without the microphone. If you can't hear me, just let me know. Uh, I did a bunch of presentations earlier today at work, and it, I kind of have the have it rolling right now. So, uh, just to kind of tell you where I come from, I um, I used to be an engineer, and I decided that I didn't really like that too much. So I got into the beer world. Uh, thanks to my wife, she kind of gave me the, the okay on that, and um, things have worked out pretty good. I uh, started home brewing almost 12 years ago now, and kind of you know turned my hobby into what I get to do every day, which is a pretty fortunate thing. I work at uh, Bell's General Store, as, as he said. Um, if you've never been in our store, I'm guessing most of you have, but if you haven't before, uh, we sell Bell's beer, we sell Bell's uh, paraphernalia, shirts, and things like that, but we also are a homebrew shop, so um, we like to think that we're the local source. If you need homebrewing advice or if you just want to come check things out, we've got um, all the stuff I'm going to show you tonight. And uh, we also do demonstrations uh, usually once a month or so that you're certainly welcome to join in. I can give you more information on that later. Uh, but we're all about all things homebrew and just kind of getting the word out and getting people interested in it. Um, I mean, kind of the idea of this talk is to kind of go over what homebrewing is, where it started, and uh, where it's come, and kind of walk you through the ingredients, the equipment, and then your basic brew day. I shouldn't. Um, if you have any questions throughout, feel free to stop me. Um, I don't like to do anything too formal, so um, we'll just kind of keep going. If you if you think of anything, feel free to to stop me. Um, Really, when you talk about homebrewing and, and how homebrewing started, you have to talk about uh, craft beer because the two go hand in hand. A lot of people think, you know, if you work for a brewery, why do you homebrew and vice versa? You know, why would you, why would you want to do something like that? So we'll get into that in a minute. Um, but when you think about back um, in the early days of, um, you know, after Prohibition, you pretty much weeded out all the, all the, the big breweries that we had. We had, you know, hundreds of breweries back then. It may have been thousands before Prohibition. And then um, after Prohibition, it, you know, by the end of the 70s, we were down to just 44. And a lot of those were just light lagers. You know, it was the, it was the mainstream beer. Um, and there, wasn't, uh, there weren't nearly as many styles as what we see today and what we saw before Prohibition. So in order to get those, you know, try a different style of beer, you either had to travel overseas or you had to make it at home, which is what kind of started uh, people homebrewing a little bit more about that time. So... Um, as of 2013, we're up to 2,822 breweries again in this country. So obviously, things are going back the other way. And you know, every week it seems like in the paper there's somebody else that's starting a new brewery. I mean, we had four or five open just, just in Kalamazoo last year. So it's it's pretty amazing to think how, of where things have come. Um, and a lot of them are, you know, even still our home brewers that you know started. Getting into getting into different beers because of because of home brewing and uh, decided to follow their passion. So um, home brewing is legal. A lot of people associate it with moonshining or something like that, which which still isn't legal. But in uh, in 1978, it was made legal uh, by the federal government. As of two years ago, it's legal in every state. Um, I think Mississippi and Alabama were the last two, and they kind of resolved those. There's stipulations in certain states where you can only brew so much, or you can't take it out of your house, or things like that. But in uh, every state it is legal in some form or fashion, and certainly in Michigan. Um, it is safe. There's no pathogens that can survive in a fermented, um, in a f a fermented beer, probably any fermented, uh, fermented beverage. But uh, there's nothing that, you know, you can screw up a batch for sure and make them bad, but there's nothing you can do that's going to kill you. At least not to the, nothing's come up yet that has killed anyone. I don't, I don't suspect that will happen anytime soon. Uh, the American Home Brewers Association is, um, as you would guess, the, the national uh, association that kind of represents home brewers and goes to, goes to battle for them and things like that. They estimate there's about 1.2 million home brewers in the U.S. And I believe, I have the number here, there's 44, uh, 43,000 members of the American Home Brewers Association. So those are your serious home brewers. Uh, we pay... Uh, I say we because I'm one of them, but we pay, you know, 40 bucks a year to be a member of, of this association, and it, it, the money goes to a good cause. They help fight for homebrewing rights. They put out a magazine every month or two months, and uh, they hold rallies and, and uh, conferences. This, this, this year's conference was actually in Grand Rapids. So, um, you know, it's, it's a 43,000 uh, pretty serious homebrewers, and 1.2 million are pretty substantial numbers, obviously. Um, 
The next question you might have is why would, you know, like I said, why would you homebrew when you, especially when you live here in a great place like Kalamazoo and there's beer in every corner and there's, you go to any supermarket and you find great craft beer. Um, to me, there's two types of people. There are people that like to cook and they just kind of throw everything in the pot and they just do it all on the fly. Those are your artistic, artistic types. They don't like to really plan ahead. They just kind of throw things together. And then there's someone that's maybe a little more scientific. I'm a little, probably a little more like this. I plan out, okay, next Tuesday, I've got a few hours. I'm going to plan this. And I, I spend days ahead of time planning out what I'm going to make. Um, and brewing, I think, combines the two of those in some form or fashion. And um, one of the nice things about brewing, I, I say this all the time, is that it's, it can be as complex or as simple as you want. The way I'm going to kind of walk you through today is a pretty simple, pretty simple method. It takes a few hours, uh, gives you five gallons of beer. It's pretty much not any more difficult than making a batch of soup. Um, but you can certainly make it more complicated. You can brew just like Bell's Brewery does or just like Open Insula does where you're, you're, you're controlling every aspect of the day and every aspect of the process. Um, there's yeast involvement. You can get real scientific with a lot of that sort of thing. So, um, and there's people that brew for years and years and years and all they want to do is that simple you know, two-hour method and there's nothing wrong with that. It still can make good beer. It's just that's the level they want to take it to. So it's one of those hobbies where you can go as deep or as, or as shallow as you want to. So um, another thing, you know, a few other things that go along with this are there's a lot of gadgets involved. There are a lot of people that like to fiddle with gadgets and build things. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like uh, the guys that are into cars, but on a much cheaper scale. They can, they can weld things together and build little gadgets that help their day go by. And it's, it's, it's real creative. And, there's a lot of engineers in the field, a lot of people with technical minds, but there's also a lot of people that are um, art, have an art background as well. So it's, it's a nice combination of people. Um, Cost-wise, it is technically cheaper, you know, to make your beer. If you're, if you're looking to save money, it's probably not the best reason to get into home brewing because you can, you're going to drink more beer. You're going to want to buy more beer. It just, it all, it's a slippery slope, I can tell you that. And, uh, you know, I'm not ashamed to say that I, I drink more beer than I did when I started, but I think craft beer drinkers, as, as you understeer, understand beer more, you drink less of good beer than you do. Uh, you know, I don't drink a 12-pack a night or anything like that. It's kind of, um, you know, I think you understand what I'm saying. Um, so there's a, you know, talking about how you can get from, you know, make it as simple as you want or as complex as you want. These are kind of the steps. There's uh, the no-boil version where, uh, I don't know if some of you have seen the Mr. Beer kits. They come out around the holidays and they're usually available at Myers and Walmart and the big box stores and stuff like that. Um, you basically have a, a pre-mixed powder or a, I guess it's a, a syrup, I think, and you dilute it into water. There's no boil involved. You pretty much, all the hops and all the additions are put into it already and you mix it up and then you ferment it and it becomes beer. Um, the next step is extract or extract with grains, and that's where we start people at in our store. If you're getting into brewing, that's what we're going to kind of talk about here. Extract refers to um, you're starting with the sugars rather than the malt. Um, and I, I, I apologize if you don't know uh, what malt is just yet. We'll get that in a few minutes, but um, that's kind of the next step, and I'll, I'll get into more detail on that. Partial mash and all grain kind of get more towards what breweries do where they, they buy loads and loads of barley and they, they do the full process and turn it all into what they want. So we'll talk about that in more detail, but um, the, um, those, are, those are kind of the, the basic steps you can take in brewing, I think. Um, the very basic process in its, in its most generic form is we take barley and the barley is malted by someone, usually called a maltster. And basically what they do to malt it is they soak the barley in water until it starts to sprout. And then they stop that by throwing it into an oven and, and roasting it to varying levels. Uh, we take, we extract the sugar from that barley and we put it into, into solution with some water. We spice it with hops. Hops, uh, we'll talk about here in a few minutes, but the hops will add bitterness and flavor to the beer and keep it from being too sweet. And then after that, we're gonna ferment it with a yeast and the yeast will turn the beer uh, or turn that liquid, which isn't beer yet, into beer, uh, creating alcohol and carbon dioxide. So that's, that's the, the view from the moon of, as far as what, what brewing is. You, it's always with barley, some sort of barley, uh, spiced with hops most of the time, there are a few exceptions, and then fermented with yeast. Um, so I will talk about the ingredients first. 
Uh, the most important ingredient, well, the most dominant uh, ingredient in, in beer is malt. And malt is barley, which has been malted. It, it's, malt is just kind of a short name for it. Um, like I said, it's, it's soaked in water. The, the barley starts to sprout, and they stop that sprouting by throwing it in a big uh, kiln. Sometimes it's kiln for a very short time, and you're, you know, the result is a nice light color like this. I'll pass these around in a minute if you want to check it out. And then um, there are other types of barley made where um, this is a caramel malt. And what this is, is a, a malt that's been, excuse me, processed in a different fashion. Um, it has a lot, a little more darkness to it. So that, that darkness uh, results in sugars that aren't totally fermentable by brewer's yeast. They're a little more complex sugars. So the sugar from something like this is gonna stay in the beer. Um, I like to think of our amber ale as a good example of that. If you're familiar with that, it pours a nice red color. It's got a nice caramel toasty note to it. Um, that's from the use of these types of malts. And then, if you couldn't guess it, something like this is just blasted in an oven till it gets real dark. Um, there's a thousand shades in between the lightest and the darkest, but um, this is one of the darker ones. This is called roasted barley. This is known for being used in stouts and porters. It gives you that coffee, roasty flavor, um, real dark, uh, bitter if you chew it. Uh, I can pass these around and feel free if you wanna take a little sample and chew, chew on them. They're kind of they're kind of crunchy like grape nuts but um, and take a good smell of them too. These uh, the caramel these are nice flavor flavor malts that kind of add the middle of the road. Uh, most I would say most beers have some amount of caramel malt in them. Certainly not every beer has something dark like this in it usually just the dark beers but some red beers or slightly colored beers will have a little bit of that just to give it some color. So malt is uh, kind of the base for your beer. You've got, um, it's, it's, the, it's the ingredient that we use the most of in each batch. Um, in an average five gallon batch, you're using about 10 pounds of malt. So that's just kind of a, just a real general estimate. It could certainly be a lot more, it could certainly be a little bit less. <coughs> the more malt you use, the higher alcohol potential you have because you're getting more sugar. So in order to make a beer stronger, you need more sugar. More sugar comes from more malt. Um, so the malt is kind of your, your canvas of, of, the, of your beer and you can tweak it by adjusting all these different colored, uh, these different colored malts in different ways. Hops are, absolutely. Is Oberon made with barley? Yes, Oberon is a wheat beer and wheat beers are typically made with um, quite a bit of wheat, but they also are usually, it's usually around 50-50. So Oberon, I can tell you, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 50% barley, 50% wheat. Nice. If you wanted to make 100% wheat beer, you would have all sorts of problems because it gets so gummy, there's a lot of gluten in wheat, and it gets, there's processing issues where it would just gum up the, the equipment that they use. So uh, it's not impossible, but it's very, it's very unlikely to use more than 60% wheat or something like that. So, um, good question though. Uh, hops are um, kind of the spice of beer is the way I think of them. Um, they are, as you see here, this is, this is actually a photo of some hops that I picked in my backyard. I grow hops at home. Um, that's how they look. They grow in a vine. They're a perennial that'll grow every year. Usually um, the first year you grow them, you'll get pretty low output. The second year, quite a bit more. And by the third year, you get full production. Um, but they're, um, they're really attractive, even if you don't use them for brewing. They're a really nice looking uh, thing. They, they have leaves. And then around late August, September, they, these, these cones grow. And there's, hops are, if you follow beer at all, they're the, they're the wave of the, you know, the, all the cool kids are doing it. It's, uh, everybody likes hoppier beers. And um, there's new varieties that come out all the time. All the varieties have different characteristics. Citrus, uh, tropical fruit. Um, there's, uh, you know, some of the English varieties that are kind of earthy or woody. You get into German varieties and they're more spicy or herbal, things like that. So there's a lot of ways to kind of tweak your beer using hops in different ways. But um, essentially they come off, you pick them off a vine like this. If you're somebody like me, you pick them by hand. And, um, and they can be processed into, usually into pellets. And pellets are probably the most popular form. Um, some people use them just like that. Sierra Nevada uses all, all leaf hops like that. But... These are pellet hops. Um, I didn't bring a little dish to put, put them in, but you're welcome to pull some out. I wouldn't eat them. They're not very, they're very bitter. 
Um, but they're full of um, they're full of oils, which the oil is where you get all the flavors and the aromas. Uh, they're full of acids, which are what we turn into the bitterness in the beer. So depending on how long they're in a boil, um, you can extract bitterness out of them. So you may think, well, I don't like bitter beer. I don't want to put hops in my beer. If you didn't put any hops in a beer, um, it would be overwhelmingly sweet. So even a small amount is just enough to counteract the sweetness of the malt. So um, yeah, you've got bitterness, flavor, and aromas that come from them. If anybody's familiar with our, our two-hearted ale at Bell's, you get a nice big aroma of that citrus flavor. That's from uh, what we call dry hopping, which is adding a big dose of hops after, fer or, yeah, after fermentation. Um, and you get, you get all the oils to come through that way. <clears throat> Yeah, if you look on that bag, it's got an alpha acid percentage, and essentially that's the um, bittering potential of that hop. So the higher the number, uh, the more per ounce that you get out, more bitterness per ounce. So if I have a hop that is 12% alpha acid and I have one that's 5% alpha acid, uh, to make two different beers with the same bitterness, I use less of the one that's 12% because it's got a lot more bittering potential. And that doesn't sound like a big deal, but when you get on a big scale, um, brewers like Budweiser and the, the big guys, they, you know, that's a lot of dollars and cents to them. So they use the highest alpha that they can because um, they're not so concerned with flavor as much as craft brewers are. So. Um, it's it not really. It kind of, I mean, it's twice as much, but it's, uh, there's utilization that changes as you as you boil and it gets a little more complicated, but it, I guess in general Yeah, it is twice as much. So is it twice as bitter as the other one? It, I guess I don't know if that'd be that's kind of a perception thing, but uh, When you you can measure bitterness units in, in a beer afterwards, and I think that would probably correlate to about twice as much So that was kind of a long answer, but you get I think that Kind of summarizes it All right, and then the third ingredient, and in my opinion, I think most brewers' opinion is the absolute most important, and that's the yeast. And yeast is shown here a lot like uh, like uh, bread yeast that you use at home. Um, <coughs> I have a packet of it here. We also we also have uh, liquid yeast, which is available to us, which is essentially a big a big slurry, and not a good thing to bring in to show show at this class. But um, basically, it's a single cell organism. Um, Yeast has a huge impact on the outcome of your beer because what we create in our brew pot during brew day is called wort, W-O-R-T, and that's beer before it becomes beer. Once it's fermented by the yeast, it's turn, it, then it's, you create the alcohol, you create the CO2, now it's beer. So we create wort, yeast creates the, the, the beer. Um, so the health of your yeast, um, the the count of your yeast as far as how much you use those are huge issues uh, your fermentation temperatures once you once you're done and we'll talk about this in a minute but once you're done uh, brewing you, you you set this bucket aside or whatever you've got your, your beer in and let it ferment a lot of people just want to forget about it but the temperatures uh, the environment that it's in that makes a huge impact on the flavor of your beer and the uh, just the performance of your yeast so one, I think yeast is one of those things where the more you brew, you understand how important it really is. When I first started brewing, it was just like, hey, I'll just, whatever yeast I can grab, I'll just use that and it's just fine. But uh, if you've ever had a, uh, a Hefeweizen, which is a, a German wheat beer, uh, we make a beer called Winter White, which is kind of along those lines. Uh, it's got a big banana kind of clove flavor. That's 100% from the yeast. That's a wheat beer, just like you were talking about. It's, a, it's pretty much, you could take the Oberon recipe and Oberon doesn't taste anything like that and throw that yeast in it and it's completely different. It's, it's just, uh, they're called, you know, there's, there's phenols and there's all sorts of these crazy science words that go with it, but it's basically it's the yeast um, pooping out all this stuff that's, that's uh, just really, really drastic uh, flavor, flavor impacts on that. It is a fungus, I believe. Yeah, I am not a, a microbiologist or anything like that, but I know enough to be dangerous. And it's it's a single cell organism. It is a fungus. Um, there's in brewing. There's a couple different types of yeast. There's ale yeast, lager yeast, and then the, the Belgian world gets a lot different too. Um, and that's about as far as I, you know, as far as I'm comfortable <laughs> saying for sure. Um, water is the fourth and final ingredient. Um, 
when you're starting, the rule of thumb is if it tastes good to drink, it's good to brew with. Um, as long as you don't have to filter your water or maybe, you know, use that filtered water. If you can't drink your water out of, out of your tap because it tastes so bad, um, you probably don't want to brew beer with it. But in most cases, especially in Michigan, where actually we have pretty good water, which I think is part of the reason we have a lot of really good breweries in Michigan. Uh, we're surrounded by water. It's pretty abundant here compared to most places. We're pretty lucky. So um, you want it to be free of chlorine. That's one thing. Um, I've found that if you just put some water in a bucket and let it sit for a few hours, most of the chlorine kind of dissipates out on its own. So um, if you can start with, with good water, you really don't have to worry. It's one of those, water is one of those really complex topics that as you get really advanced, that's one of those things where if I'm going to get into water, I'm serious about brewing. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a very complex and uh, confusing topic, I think. Um, and before we get into how to make the beer, um, beer styles is, is kind of a, a good thing to kind of cover. In the world of beer, you know, everything is a beer. You've got two main categories. You've got ales and lagers. Um, the big guys, the, the Budweiser's and the Coors and things like that, they primarily make a, a light lager. Uh, those are pretty much, and, and I'll explain the difference here in a minute. The, the world of craft beer is primarily ales. And then the biggest reason for that is that you can ferment ales, and most of us homebrewers ferment ales um, around room temperature. So there's not a lot of extra equipment needed, and um, that fermentation at room temperature takes place a lot faster than a lager. A lager ferments much cooler. You're talking uh, about 50 degrees, and you need special equipment to keep things at 50 degrees, and um, things slow down when you're at 50 degrees, so it takes twice as long to make a lager as, as it does to make an ale. Uh, ales are a lot more flavorful. They have, um, you know, because of that increased speed of the yeast, you get more esters, fruit flavors, you get uh, more sweetness. Um, pale ale, IPA, stout, wheat beers, Belgian beers, those are all under the ale category. So um, some people think you know, a stout is different from a, is not an ale, it's its own thing, but a stout is an ale, it uh, it's, it's uses an ale yeast. Lagers, like I said, the big guys make those. Um, a lot of craft brewers make them too, but it does take up a lot more capacity and you gotta have you know, it ties up a tank for, if you're a big production brewery and you need to keep things moving, a tank being tied up for four weeks as opposed to two weeks is money in your pocket. So, um, you know, it's something to think about. Uh, like I mentioned, it works around 50 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, they're a lot cleaner, maltier, um, just because everything slows down. Uh, your yeast works a lot slower, so you get a lot crisper, cleaner flavors. And the way a lager works is you pretty much, you ferment it um, for as long as it takes to ferment out which is usually three to four weeks at say 50 degrees. And then you lager it. And lagering it means that you store it as cold as you can get it without freezing for a certain amount of time. And usually the stronger the beer, the longer you lager it. So a Pilsner, which I would consider a lighter beer, um, you know, the rule of thumb with those is you, usually you lager them for about four weeks. So you've fermented it for three to four weeks to begin with, then you lager it for another four weeks. That's two months basically of tying up a tank. Um, if you're a brewery. As a home brewer, you can do whatever you want as long as you can control those temperatures. So lagers become the advanced home brewing uh, style or category of beers, I would say. Most people, when they're starting out, I would never say make your first beer a lager because it's, you're just asking for problems. Um, Pilsner, Oktoberfest, uh, Bach beers, those are all examples of lager styles. And most of the big uh, big breweries, you know, I said they make light lagers. They're, that's pretty close to a Pilsner. That's, uh, you know, as far as comparisons go. Um, next, I want to talk about some of the equipment. <coughs> Excuse me. I've got um, most of it sitting up here, so I'll kind of walk through this. Uh, your brew day begins with, um, with your boil kettle. That's your, that's your friend for the day, basically. This right here is a 20-quart or 5-gallon uh, brew pot. And this happens to be stainless steel. The nice thing about a brew pot is that you don't have to have a vessel that's totally dedicated to brewing. If you've got a big chili pot at home, if you've got a lobster pot that you cook with, maybe it's aluminum, maybe it's enamel that you can with or something like that, those are fine. Don't go out and buy a special brew pot just for, just for, uh, just for brewing. Um, if you've got something, you could save some money that way. That's a big, uh, a big saver right there. If you're going to buy one, uh, stainless steel is is probably the nicest is because it's going to last the longest if you find a deal on an aluminum one don't worry about that that works just fine um, 
But I do say, you know, five gallons is a good minimum size. Uh, you can certainly, I know people that use four or three gallons and they get away with it, but the smaller you get, the more you concentrate your boil. And the more you concentrate your boil, the more things change, uh, you know, outside of the way you want them to go. Um, we're actually going to boil um, about three gallons, and you can do this on your stovetop. Um, and by the time you're done boiling, then you're going you're gonna to top up with water. So uh, you essentially, you know, the biggest pot you can afford, I, I usually recommend that, but five gallons is a good minimum. Uh, let's see here. I'll go to the fermenter. The fermenter is um, the next piece of equipment that I, um, I'm guessing most people don't have sitting around at their house. Uh, there are several options with that. The most basic would be a plastic bucket like this. And you can't just go down to Home Depot or something like that and pick up a five gallon bucket from them. Those are typically made from recycled materials that, um, you know, during fermentation, you could potentially leach some of those things into your beer. Uh, this is a food grade bucket. You always want to make sure everything's food grade if, whenever possible. Um, this is a six and a half gallon bucket. Five gallons comes to about right here, but you need that extra gallon and a half of headspace because during fermentation, things bubble up and you get a nice head of foam and you need room for that. So uh, whether you use a, a bucket or a carboy, which I'll talk about here in a second, or anything else, you want to have headspace above the size that you're brewing. So if you have a five gallon bucket, food grade, uh, you probably are going to want to brew like a three gallon batch. So just something to keep in mind. Um, a lid. We sell these at the store as a set, or, well, you buy them individually, but they, um, you know, typically you need a lid of some sort. And then the lids come with a pre-hole dr uh, drill and grommet for an airlock. And the airlock's job is to, you fill it about halfway with water and it kind of bubbles. And as, as pressure builds up in this thing, as it, as it ferments, it's giving off CO2. It allows the CO2 to escape, but it doesn't let any oxygen or contaminants get into the beer. So it's kind of your way of letting this thing build up pressure or avoid this thing building up too much pressure and blowing. So it's, it's, a, it's a release for it. Um, the other option or one of the other options is a carboy. Uh, I personally am a carboy user, but I will tell you they're very heavy. They're a little more expensive and they're very dangerous. If you drop one of these on your cement floor, they will break. <laughs> I've done that a few times and it's not fun. But um, the nice thing about those is that you can see inside them. When, when fermentation's going on, it looks like a lava lamp. I mean, there's just stuff moving all over the place and it's really cool. Uh, you can see, you know, you can, it, it kind of makes you feel better too because you can see that things are happening where on this, you know, if your bubbler's bubbling, that's a good sign that things are going on. But I like to, I like to look and see what's happening. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very reassuring to me. Um, you just have to be careful with them. They make handles for them. They make straps uh, for them to carry them around. And whenever you have wet hands, that's never a good time to handle them. That's, I learned that pretty quick. So um, there are stainless uh, fermenters as well, but that's usually in a pretty big price range, probably in the 800 to $1,000 for a big stainless conical kind of thing. But they are available, but um, I don't know very many people that have them. Did you have a question? Yeah, the carboys, um, there's bungs that, that, we, that they make that either fit in here or I use a, a thing called a, a carboy cover that fits right over the top and kind of holds on to that for it. So same idea, yep. <laughs> you definitely don't want pressure to build up in one of these because, uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, equipment for bottling. So... I'm going to walk through the process in a few minutes about how, the, how it goes, but essentially you have one brew day. You get your beer into your fermenter, and then it kind of sits in that fermenter for typically at least two weeks, sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, but then it comes time to bottle. And um, bottling is a pain in the butt. If you have a helper or a friend or something, that's, that's a good time to get the, to recruit them to come help you because uh, having four hands instead of two makes the day go a lot smoother and um, can be more fun. Um, the first thing is a bottling bucket, and a bottling bucket is exactly the same as the fermenting bucket, except it's been equipped with a, um, a spigot. And the reason for the spigot is for filling bottles. Now instead of, um, now I can, I can drain with gravity from this, and all I have to do is open this valve and now beer pours out. And I'll explain to you why, why we don't want beer to pour out, or how, how we stop it from pouring out in a second. But we also will use a bottle filler. And a bottle filler is basically just a plastic wand and it's got a little valve on the bottom. And when, that, when there's beer in this or any liquid in this, that valve is shut. 
when you push the bottom against something, it releases the valve and beer comes out. So um, if I've got beer in here and I put it into the bottom of my bottle, I, I hit it until it fills the bottle to the top. And when I pull it out, it leaves just the right amount of headspace in the top of your bottle. So it's, um, you know, it's a genius idea, really. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't consider this an optional piece of equipment. This is pretty much something you have to have. The way I like to bottle is to um, fill my bottling bucket, put this under here, and then I'll, and it just hangs there. And you can just do like a hands-free bottling. I think we've got a picture of it up there. I don't know if you can see it, but um, you're basically just, one hand goes up, fills the bottle, go to the next one, hand it to your buddy, let them cap it, and it makes life a lot easier. Um, and then the final piece for, uh, for bottling day is your capper. And as you may imagine, it's sometimes they're red, sometimes they're black, but this is essentially, there's a little magnet in there that holds your cap. You put it on your bottle, you crimp it down, life is good. <clears throat> so that's your equipment that you need for, for bottling day. Um, some of the optional equipment, and I don't know that I would consider this optional, but this is a, this is called a hydrometer, and a hydrometer measures spe specific gravity. The specific gravity of water is 1, 1 1.0, and as you add sugar to water, your specific gravity increases. So, um, if I take the specific gravity of my beer before it ferments, it should be nice, you know, it should be quite a bit more than one, I hope, because there's sugar in there. As it ferments, those sugars turn into alcohol, the sugar content goes down. I can take the gravity again after my beer is fermented, and then I, there's a calculation I can do between those two numbers to calculate alcohol percentage. Um, you know, alcohol percentage isn't the only thing that's important about a, a hydrometer, but it's a good way to understand your beer, and as you get more into brewing, it's something that means a lot more as you develop recipes and things like that. It has to do with the balance of your beer between bitterness and maltiness, the sweetness of your beer, all sorts of things. So this is a, a really nice tool. When I first started brewing, I didn't know what this was. I, I would take the readings and the numbers didn't mean anything to me. But after you kind of get a grasp for what, um, what the numbers mean, it really starts to mean quite a bit more. And then another um, kind of optional upgrade, I guess, this is the one we use in the store, so you can see it's all dirty. But this is a, um, a wort chiller. And essentially, what happens is after we've boiled for a long time, we want to cool that, uh, that wort down to uh, temperature as fast as we can because we need to get the yeast in it, and uh, the heat will kill the yeast. So you want to get from about 212 degrees down to 65, 70 degrees as fast as you can. So what I do is I put this in my brew pot with 15 minutes to go, and that will sanitize it. So then at the end of my boil, because the heat, the heat from the boil will sanitize it, at the end of my boil, I turn off the heat and I start running cold water through this coil. And through heat transfer, uh, it cools down the wort really quickly. And if it's in the middle of the winter and the groundwater is uh, nice and cold, it'll happen really fast. But even in the middle of the summer, you're probably, you know, 15 to 20 minutes, which, which is, uh, can save a lot of time on your day. And as, you, as your batches grow in size, if you decide to do more than five gallons, um, that can be a really nice thing to, a really nice thing to have. Yeah, so this is our boil pot. I'm gonna boil, I'll go through the process here in a minute, but we're gonna boil for a full hour. And with um, 15 minutes left in my boil, I put this in here. So for those 15 minutes, it's just being boiled, which sanitizes it. So now, when my boil's over, after 15 minutes, I turn off my, my flame, and I start running cold water through that. And that just transfers into this, copper's really, high uh, temperature transfer, so it's going to um, cool it down fairly quick. Okay. So brew day, I'm going to walk you through the process, and if I lose track of something, let me know. But this is, uh, this is the basic gist of how things work. We're going to, the very first thing we're going to do for almost every recipe, there are a few exceptions, but I'm going to give you the, the general. I brought a kit here. And this is a, an ingredient kit. We sell these out of the store. They range from $25 to $45 probably. And <coughs> your, what's included is your malt extract, which is a syrup form of the sugar that comes from the malted barley. Uh, sometimes it's in a powder form. Sometimes it's in both, which it is in this case. Um, and this is a dark extract. And what that means is it's got some... It's got the fermentable sugars in here, but it's also got some sugars that are not fermentable, 
like that black malt that I passed around earlier, that's in here. So it's good. Th those dark ones are going to stay in the beer. They're not going to ferment out. You're going you're gonna to be left with flavors, colors, and aromas from that. So it's going to turn your, your, your beer a little darker, quite a bit darker in this case. Um, and we've also got some crushed malt. And this crushed malt is what we're going to use first. We're going to make a tea out of it, essentially. So what we'll do is we'll fill our kettle with you know, probably two gallons of water. It's really, the, the, the amount of water is kind of arbitrary. It's just enough to, to submerge our bag, essentially. And we're going to heat it up to around 150, 155 degrees. And then we're going to take a grain sock, which is basically a muslin bag like this, cheesecloth, and put that crushed grain inside there. And that's what we're doing here in this, I don't know if you can see if the table's in the way, but the, um, you've basically got a bag full of, of crushed grain and we're going to drop it in into the water and you're just you're basically making a tea out of it and we're going to um, you're going to soak out all the the flavors and the aromas from it depending on the style of beer you're making sometimes it's going to turn it dark and sometimes it's going to turn it amber sometimes it's not going to turn it much of anything at all but it's going to give it all sorts of flavors you're going to smell it right away it's, it smells like heaven um, and it's got <laughs> it really does and um, you're, you're essentially going to let it steep in there, you know, around 150 degrees. The temperature is not really important. You don't want it to be cold. You don't want it to be too hot. You're going to let it steep for about 20 minutes. Um, I keep one of these thermometers around. These are really nice. They've got like a dial face that just kind of sit on the edge of your, your brew pot like that so you can look at it. You don't have to pull anything out. You can just look at the temperature. Keep it around 150 degrees uh, for about 20 minutes. So it's a good time to go have a quick beer and wait for your, for your steep to finish up. So um, maintaining the temperature is not a huge deal. I, you know, halfway through the 20 minutes, give it a check. If it's dropped, kick the heat on for just a second, but otherwise you should be good. <clears throat> After you steep for your 20 minutes, uh, you're going to pull out your grain and you can compost it. You can, uh, some people make cookies out of it. Pretty much all the sugar is gone out of this. So it's pretty much just, were you going to say something? So that's spent grain. That's spent grain, yep. Yeah, this is, a, you know, when you're using extract, you're just going to have a small bag of it. If you get more advanced and you use, and you use all grain, you're going to have, you know, 20 pounds of, of wet grain, too. So that's a little more advanced. But um, pull this out, and now you want to bring, now your liquid is not, it's not water anymore. It's called wort. It's, it's, wort bef it's beer before it turns into beer. And now you want to bring this to a boil. So um, kick on your burner. Uh, get your exhaust fan going if you're in your, in your kitchen. Open up some windows because there's a lot of steam that's going to come once this thing starts boiling. So uh, I have some friends that are people that I know that have uh, ruined some kitchen cabinets and things like that. So something to keep in mind. If you've got good ventilation in your kitchen, make sure you use it. If you don't, you may want to find a way to get outside, maybe with an outside burner or something like that. But um, basically, you want to bring that, that solution up to, up to a boil. And now, now that the boil is starting, we're going to add the extracts. Um, like I said, in this case, we've got both dry and liquid. Sometimes it's one or the other. Uh, sometimes it's both. The liquid is just like molasses. I mean, it's really thick. So you're going to want to, um, I like to soak it in hot water ahead of time. That kind of loosens things up and helps it pour a little easier. It's also good to, as you're adding it, uh, either have someone stirring pretty vigorously or turn down your heat because what it can do is it can drop right down before it dissolves entirely and scorch. And I've learned that the hard way a few times. So you want to um, you want to add your extract to your boil. Uh, as soon as you add that extract and your boil's going, you're going to set your timer for about an hour because this whole process is going to take about an hour. Um, the boil is the the whole day is going to be more like three hours. So set some time aside. Um, and then throughout the boil, depending on your recipe, it all depends on what beer you're making. You're going to add hops. Uh, like I said, hops can add bitterness. They can add flavor. They can add aroma. Depending on when you add them to the boil, that's what determines what you get out of them. Um, the hops that you want for bitterness are going to go at the beginning of the boil because as you boil them, the, oil, the oils get boiled off and you're left with the bittering component. If you add them right at the end of the boil, those oils are still in there and the bittering didn't really get to develop. So you're left with a uh, big aroma, big flavor. Um, I talked about Two Hearted earlier. That's a good example too. That's, that's got big hop additions close to the end of the boil, there's hardly anything at the beginning of the boil because it's not a very bitter beer. I, it's kind of bitter, but you know, it depends on your, on your taste, I guess. Um, so you're adding your, 
your extract at the beginning of the boil, you're setting your timer, and then you're adding your hops as your as your um, as your recipe dictates. So we're going to boil for about one hour. A nice rolling boil doesn't have to be jumping out of the pot, but just something that you're turning things over. Basically, the, the idea is the liquid comes up and it turns over and it keeps moving. <clears throat> That'll get the the hops involved um, in the boil. Uh, a one hour boil is standard. There are certainly exceptions depending on your recipe, but it's rarely any more than an hour and a half and rarely much less than that too. So something to keep in mind. Okay, so now our boil's over. Uh, our one hour is up. If you have a wort chiller, hopefully you stuck it in the wort with 15 minutes to go to sanitize it. If you don't, um, you've got about three gallons of hot liquid that needs to get chilled down as fast as possible. Uh, one of the quickest ways to do that is to get lots of ice <laughs> and put it in, fill up a sink with ice water and submerge it and just every couple minutes give it a good stir because if it sits for too long it's just going to kind of stabilize and all the hot stuff's going to stay in the middle of this and all the cold stuff's going to stay on the outside. A lot of people think in the winter time they can you know throw it in a snow bank is a good idea. That doesn't work. Uh, you could throw it in there and it basically you know it may get a little shock at first but it just becomes an insulator after a few minutes so unless you're moving it from snow bank to snow bank <laughs> that'd be a little more work anyway so um, yeah so Whatever way you can to, to get the temperature down, a wort chiller is the best option. An ice bath works just fine if you've only got three gallons. Um, if you step up and you get beyond three gallons, then you're going to want to invest in a wort chiller. Um, so now we've chilled our wort down. We're down to, you know, we want to be around room temperature. I'd say about 68 degrees is a good spot for an ale, which is what everybody's making on their first batch because the lagers are too hard. Um, now we want to move it into the fermenter. Now at this point, everything that touches this beer needs to be sanitized. Um, did I talk about sanitizers? <laughs> okay. Sanitizers are um, available in several different forms. When I started brewing, I used a bleach solution and I, you know, I rubbed it all around and let it touch everything. And then you have to be real careful to rinse everything really well. And if you don't rinse it very well, you get really nasty flavors in your beer. And bleach is nasty stuff anyway, so I would definitely recommend not doing that. I learned that the hard way. Uh, there are several sanitizers made for home brewing that are rinse-free. They're really nice. They're, they're acid-based, there's uh, oxygen-based, and there's iodine-based. All of them have short contact times, basically a couple minutes touching them. Some of them are as short as 30 seconds, but a couple minutes touching the surfaces. You rinse it out, you pour it out. You don't have to rinse anything. You don't have to dry anything. It's beer-ready as soon as you do that. So. Um, everything, at, once that boils over, everything that's going to touch the beer, even your spoon, needs to be sanitized. So um, the boil took care of the sanitization on the first half of it. So now I've got my fermenter. I need to get everything sanitized. I've sanitized it really well. I've got the lid sanitized, the, the airlock. Now I need to get this beer, or this wort, into my fermenter. Uh, this is the one time in the whole process where oxygen is your friend. Uh, oxygen is typically the enemy of the beer. It helps, it makes beers... Uh, stale a lot faster, but yeast needs oxygen to get going. So this is the one time where adding oxygen is okay. So what I would recommend is, you know, pouring this thing from as high <laughs> up as you can. It gets a nice, you know, it gets a nice froth going. The, the other option is to pour it in there and, you know, put the lid on it and just shake the heck out of it. Uh, I used to take like a sanitized whisk and just beat it up as much as I could until I got tired and then I did a little bit more. Uh, you know, sanitize the whisk and just, just beat a froth into it. Basically, you want to get as much oxygen as you can, and then your yeast is going to use that oxygen as fuel to get going. So you've essentially poured in your three gallons. You're going to have to top it up with water um, because you want to be at five gallons. We're making a five-gallon batch, but you've only got about three gallons in here because you had a five-gallon pot to start with, and you boiled off a bunch. If you started with three gallons, you're probably down to two and a half after the boil. So these are things to keep in mind. Um, you're going to add your yeast. In most cases, that's going to be dry yeast, especially when you're starting. It looks a lot like the yeast that you use uh, for making bread. Sometimes there's directions on the back for hydrating it ahead of time, kind of like you do with, with, uh, with bread yeast, and I would recommend following those instructions. Um, and then you just, you're just going to add it to that uh, oxygenated wort, and you're going to seal it up and put it in a safe place for hopefully two weeks. You're going to see uh, activity for about two to three days where it's really going, the bubbler should just be going like crazy, and then it's going to slow right down. But that doesn't mean it's done. It's pretty much doing, it's done its thing that's active, but it's still doing some cleanup work that you don't really see. 
So don't worry if it was really going fast for a few days and now it stopped. That's the biggest thing we get. We get calls about all the time is, you know, it was going like crazy and then all of a sudden it stopped. Well, it didn't stop. It just slowed down and it's kind of maxed out most of the sugars. Now it's cleaning up some of the off flavors that it created. So um, that's, and the other thing I like to tell people is that, um, you know, you spend all this, all this time, you spent this three to three hours or whatever it is making this beer. And then they just throw it in the fermenter, in the fermenter and put it in the corner and forget about it. Fermentation is probably one of the most important parts of the whole process. And if you have any way of keeping it in a place where it's nice, steady temperatures, your beer will thank, will thank you for it. It's going to be, um, you know, your typical ale, you want to be somewhere in the 68 to 70 degree range. Um, a lot of basements in Michigan are around that temperature most of the time, so that's a good option. Uh, not next to the furnace that's kicking on and off or anything like that. But um, like I said, you're going you're gonna to see three to five days of good, vigorous fermentation. My rule of thumb, personally, is I like to go 10 days to two weeks before I do anything with the beer. Even if it's stopped after two days bubbling, it's still fine just sitting there. Don't worry about it. Um, it's doing its own conditioning. It's, it, it creates a lot of off flavors when the yeast starts to, starts to do its thing, and it's basically cleaning those up. Even though you're not seeing a lot, if you were to taste it day by day, you would see that it's cleaning things up. So um, be patient with fermentation. Let it do its thing. Don't worry about um, things speeding up and slowing down. As, you know, unless you never see anything at all, unless it never did anything, then you don't have an issue. And that happens sometimes too, but that usually has to do with temperature. So if you can keep it in the 68 degree range, you're going to be in, in Fat City. Um, if you're using a carboy, a glass carboy, I would recommend throwing a towel over it because Sunlight especially is bad for beer. That's what skunks beer. A lot of people don't know that, but um, and to a lesser degree, fluorescent lights can do that too. It takes a lot longer, but um, a bucket's pretty safe by itself. Um, but yeah, if it's in a carboy of some sort, I'd probably throw something over it or put it in a closet. <coughs> um, okay, so now, absolutely. Uh, turbo yeast is pretty fast. Turbo yeast is typically used for distilling. Did you know that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> turbo, yeast, turbo yeast is made to work really fast. So I would think, I've never used it, so I actually can't speak to that, but I, my understanding is that in a couple days it's done. So that cleaning up process gets taken care of by the next process that you do. So the, the yeah. Uh, champagne yeast is probably more related to beer yeast. It takes a little longer. I, I've used champagne yeast and it, it does work fast, uh -huh. but um, even the fastest, you know, like English ale yeast and things like that are really fast. I'd still be in the one week to eight day range before I would do anything, so probably. Yeast sort of a different Turbo yeast is a different animal. Yeah, it's made to work really fast where flavor is less of a concern because you're gonna, you're gonna take care of that later, <laughs> so. <laughs> um, Okay, so bottling day, um, so you fermented this beer, hopefully it, everything bubbled for a few days, you had a good 10 days of letting it uh, condition for your average ale. The stronger the beer, the longer it's going to need to set, but your, your average ale, you're talking 10 days to two weeks before it's bottling day. So now it's bottling day. The very most important thing of this whole day is sanitation, because everything that touches the beer is going to need to be sanitized. Uh, you're going to use your no-rinse sanitizer like we talked about. You're going to sanitize. The first thing you do is sanitize your bottling bucket. And at this point, we've got warm, flat beer. We need to add carbonation when we bottle it. So to do that, we add sugar back to the beer. And the yeast that's left, there's always yeast left. Whether, you, whether it's crystal clear or not, there's definitely yeast in there. Um, the yeast will turn that sugar. It will try to carbonate it. And if it's locked inside a bottle, that car or it's, I'm sorry, it's going to try to ferment that and it's locked inside a bottle, it can't go anywhere, so it builds up pressure, and that's what creates carbonation. So what we do is we typically, um, like these kits will come with a pre-dosed amount of priming sugar, which is basically just a small bag of corn sugar. <coughs> Table sugar works too. Um, this is five ounces, and this will do a five-gallon batch. So what we do is we prepare this by boiling it in some warm water just to kind of make sure it's there's nothing living in it. It's more of a sanitation thing. I honestly wouldn't be afraid to just pour it in there, but usually putting it in some hot water just to kind of kill off anything isn't a bad idea. Put that into your sanitized bucket, and now we're going to transfer the beer 
into the bottling bucket. And transferring isn't as simple as just pouring. We don't pour, we don't splash. Oxygen is the enemy at this point. Uh, so in the home brewing world, what we do is we siphon. And um, this little device is called an auto siphon. I didn't talk about this already, did I? The auto siphon is worth its weight in gold. <laughs> it may not look like it, but this thing will make your life so much easier. It's this part of it. It's a, it's a tube inside a tube, and pumping it creates a siphon. When I first started home brewing, I, would, um, I had what was called a racking cane, which looks just like this. And then you'd put a piece of tubing on it, and you would sanitize the whole thing. And you'd fill it with either water or sanitizer, and you'd sanitize your thumbs, and you'd kind of drop this in here and drop this into your other bucket and hope that a, hope that a siphon would start. And 90% of the time it didn't work and you'd be there, you know, it's just so frustrating. So then I found one of these auto siphons and its job is to create a siphon for you. So you sanitize your auto siphon, you attach some tubing to the end of it like this, uh, you put the vessel that you're going from up high and the vessel you're going to down low because you're still using gravity as a siphon. Um, you, put your, you put it in here, you put this into the destination one, you pump it once or twice and your, your siphon is started. And the idea is to siphon as gently as you can. You don't want to splash anything at this point because, again, oxygen is the enemy. So you, want to just, you don't want it to run down the side of the bucket or anything like that. You want it to go right to the bottom and just fill real gently. Um, so we've got our priming sugar. Yeah, you want to sanitize that. Well, I know before you use it, but you don't have to have it like filled with sanitizer. No. No, it can be empty, yep. And, and if there is some residual sanitizer in it, don't worry about getting it all out. It all neutralizes when it hits beer. It's, it's a, a, a pH thing, basically. So usually, you know, I'll still have some sanitizer dripping in mine. It's, it's no worries. Because it's not in here yet. We're getting ready to put it into here. We've got, we've got it in our fermenter, and we want to go into this. So I've got my priming solution in here. I took my sugar, and I boiled it for a minute just to make sure that it's sanitized. I put that in here. Now I'm going to rack, or tra you know, racking is, is, is transferring our beer from here into our, our bottling bucket. And what happens is as I add it to the bottling bucket, it mixes in with the sugar. And um, it's only going to be in this for a minute, you know, for as long as it takes me to bottle. So it's not going to be in this vessel for very long. So I've, I, sanitized, I sanitized this, I put my sugar in there, and now I rack the beer on top of it. So now I've got the beer in my bottling bucket and I'm ready to start bottling. Two cases of bottles is for a five gallon batch is about what you're gonna get, so 48 bottles or so. Um, if you have pry top bottles at home, you can certainly wash them out and reuse them. We sell new bottles for fairly cheap down at our store and you can probably find them at most homebrew shops as well. But um, two cases is what you can plan on getting out of five gallons. Sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. So you've sanitized it, you've got everything in here now. You sanitized your, your bottle filler, you sanitize your bottles, you sanitize your caps, <laughs> everything's sanitized. And now what we like to do is just kind of put this little stub on here and it just hangs off. Fill your bottles one by one, go right down the line. The, um, the priming solution is, should be mixed in, so each bottle should be dosed with the, the correct amount of sugar. Um, there's also little tablets that they make. You can dose each bottle instead of putting the sugar in here, so that's kind of an alternative. Um, I think it's a little bit easier because each bottle gets the same amount of sugar that way. But if you do it right, if you put the sugar in here first and then put the beer on top of it, it seems to work out just fine as well. Um, fill your bottles, everything's sanitized. Not a bad idea to sanitize your hands. Um, your capper doesn't need to be sanitized because it's all on the outside of the, of the bottles. But uh, you should end up with about two cases worth of whatever beer you made. <clears throat> Uh, okay, and then, unfortunately, your beer's not ready to drink yet. <laughs> it's got to carbonate, and so what needs to happen is it needs to ferment in the bottle, which creates, you know, that small amount of sugar is just enough to carbonate the beer, so it's going to try to ferment inside that bottle, but it's got no place to go, so it just builds up pressure, and that's where, that's where carbonation comes from. So instead of throwing them in the fridge or anything like that, you want to leave them in a, in a warm place. Again, somewhere around 78, or I'm sorry, 68 to 70 degrees. Uh, even a little warmer is not going to hurt it. So the war you know, if it's the cool months, you don't want to put it in your 60 degree uh, basement because you probably, you may get carbonation eventually, 
but it's going to move a lot slower at those at those cool temperatures. So um, keep them on the main floor of your house or you know wherever you've got a, a decent um, you know temperature in that range. And uh, hopefully you know after a week or so, I usually like to try one and see how it's coming along. But after about two weeks, it usually should be about be all the way there. It's not a bad idea too. Once in a while, if you think of it, if you're walking by it, and maybe flip the bottles over just to kind of jostle things up. Usually doesn't isn't necessary, but it may speed things up a little bit. Um, and that's pretty much how you make beer as far as the the brew day. Um, if I missed anything, or if if there's anything that you feel I skimmed over, feel please feel free to ask me. I kind of wanted to, you know, keep it as simple as I could, but show you every step. Um, absolutely. Outside of the kit, um, the kit comes with a fermenter, a bottling bucket, everything you, you have to have, minus the wort, the wort chiller is an add-on. The kettle is actually outside the, the, the kit too, which I think is kind of nice because a lot of people already have a kettle and they don't need to buy another one. So if you've already got a pot at home, um, plan on using that. But if you need to buy a, a kettle, just know it's not in that starter kit. Um, the thermometer that I showed you is not in the kit. There is a thermometer, but it's a different one that you have to it's like a lab thermometer that you stick in with your, yeah, and it's, you know, they work just fine, but I like this because it just hangs there, it's hands-free kind of thing, it's always looking at you. Um, there is a hydrometer, there is a bottle, everything to bottle for sure is in there. Um, and the, there's a couple versions of the kits, there's a basic kit and there's a deluxe kit. And the basic kit is kind of the bare bones, uh, it's about six, $65, Chris, does that sound right? $65. And, um, and then the, the deluxe kit kind of adds some things that are nice to have, but you don't have to have. Um, they add a carboy, which kind of adds a secondary conditioning tank where you can, after you've fermented, you can rack it into this before you bottle and kind of let the beer condition a little bit. Uh, I don't want to get too much into that. It's kind of a, you know, it's kind of an argumentative or like a, I don't know. There's different opinions on whether or not it's necessary, but it's, um, it's an optional step, I guess, basically. I personally think that the basic kit is a really nice investment for 65 bucks, and then buy yourself an auto siphon because it doesn't have an auto siphon. The auto siphon is, in my opinion, a must have. It, for eight bucks or whatever it is, it's really worth the money. Um, so yeah, so I hope that answers that question. But as you do this, um, some other fermented beverages that you can make at home, besides the one you and I talked about. Uh, wine, wine is another one. Uh, mead and cider are really popular this time, this time of year because this is kind of the harvest. Cider especially with all the cider uh, um, presses around, around town starting to produce cider. Um, they are a hundred times easier than making beer just because, uh, and not easier, but uh, shorter or simpler. All you're doing is mixing the juice or the mead is fermented honey or the, um, or the cider. You're mixing it usually with water and you're adding yeast and that's pretty much all there is to it. There's no boil involved, there's no hop additions or anything like that. You don't have to invert the sugars at that point, right? Uh, no, you, well, you may be inverting some sugars, but for the most part what you're doing is you're coagulating proteins, which means you're kind of, um, you know, rearranging the proteins and getting things to drop out. You're getting hops uh, added in there, which, which gives you bitterness. So there has to be a boil for that. Plus you're sanitizing and there's, there's probably a few other things going on too. But with wine, um, you know, we, we sell wine kits and they're basically just a big, ju a big bla bladder of, of juice. If you've got access to wines, you can crush them yourself. There's ways to kind of sterilize them. And then you, you know, you pretty much just add yeast at that point. There's, there's a lot, it's a lot quicker process. I've made mead and cider. I've never made wine, but um, whenever I make them, it's like, man, it feels like cheating. It's just like, it was like two hours and I was done, you know, from start to finish, it was two hours and that included having a beer in the middle or something, you know, it's just, it's really fast. So, um, but it's, it's something to kind of explore. A lot of people aren't very familiar with mead and I wouldn't be either if I hadn't gotten into beer and beer making, it was like, oh, I'll try that. And same with cider. And it's, it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, another thing to introduce to your friends. And, and you know, as you know, cider's catching on, cider's all over the place now. Um, a few tips I would give you besides some of the ones I mentioned earlier is to kind of organize what you're going to do ahead of time. Have a plan. 
<clears throat> even if you're on that other end of the spectrum where you're, you're a brew on the whim kind of person, have an idea of what you have in, on, on hand, what ingredients you have available. Um, write down everything you can as far as your recipe, things that went right, things that went wrong, temperatures, even fermentation. I kind of like to keep track of that because you may make the best beer you've ever made and if you didn't take good notes, you'll never be able to do it again. And you may make the worst beer you've ever made, and which is more likely. And uh, you definitely don't want to do that again. So maybe you can, even if you can bring it into somebody that knows, you know, bring it into our store and show it to us. We may be able to say, well, yeah, this is what's wrong. You, you boiled your, you know, you did something crazy here or whatever. Um, so try to get yourself a little notebook or something that you keep track of all your recipes with and, and take good notes. I, that's a big thing that I've learned a lot from just looking back at notes. Because when I make a beer again, I always go back and see what happened the last time and see what I need to tweak. Uh, cleaning and sanitation, they become second nature after you brew quite a bit, but it's one of those things that when you first get started, remember anything after this brew pot, after the boil is over, has to be spick and span. And um, the, like I said, the chemicals that are available to homebrewers really make it easy. You can, you know, there's no rinsing involved. They're pretty quick. Um, but just get in the habit. Cleaning and sanitation are two steps. You know, the cleaning is basically getting the gunk off it. And then sanitizing is the last step right before you put your beer into it. And it's, it's a really good, um, good way to screw up a beer if you don't. You know, it's a bummer to, to have bottle bombs or something like that. Bottle bombs is an expression for uh, you got a bacteria in your beer and it just kept eating the sugars and you open it up and the beer just shoots all over because, because it wasn't sanitized and some sort of uh, bacteria got in there and kept eating the sugars. Um, and the other thing is to get involved. We have a really good local club. Uh, I know you come to a lot of club meetings. Uh, Kalamazoo Libation Organization of Brewers is the name of our club. Club, K-L-O-B. <coughs> we meet every third Monday at Boatyard Brewing. And um, just, you know, get to know other home brewers in the area and share notes. And that, to me, that's what home brewing is all about, is sharing ideas and sharing beers and talking about what you did with your last batch and what you're going to do with the next one. And, um, there's a lot of local, there's a lot of local home brewers. There's obviously a lot of beer in this area. Uh, can bottle bombs really be too, like, too much sugar? Or is yes. It yeah. <laughs> if you follow, yeah, if you followed your, your procedures and you, you sugar, you know, you dosed it right with sugar, it shouldn't be an issue. Um, but yeah, if you did put way too much sugar when you went to prime it or something like that, you could potentially blow bottles up, which, um, doesn't happen a lot because, you know, People, I mean, there's a lot of information out there on how much sugar to add and things like that, but I've done it, and it's, it's certainly possible. It's, uh, yeah. Do you have to pay attention to yeast that is uh, settled out to the bottom of your ale pail where you're going to decant off to get uh, the bottle filled? Yeah, and that's one of the nice things about, like, an auto siphon. It's got this little tip on it that sort of uh, diverts so that it's sucking the liquid from above rather because this is going to sit this is your yeast cake. It's going to kind of sit on top of the yeast cake. And instead of drawing the yeast, the yeast directly up, it's going to kind of draw the liquid around. It kind of acts as a filter. And you want to, yeah, the more you can leave behind, the better. If it ends up in your bottles or in something else, it's not a big deal. It all drops out. If you may notice, uh, even Bell's beers are unfiltered. If you pour them, you may notice that a little bit of sludge in the bottom. That's just yeast. Good for you. Most people don't like to leak, look at it or drink it, but it's not going to hurt you. Uh, it may add a little bit of yeast character to your beer, but depending on uh, you know, how much you can leave behind, your beer is going to be that much clearer in the bottle. So um, there is, any, like I said, even if, you're, if your beer is crystal clear, there's still billions of yeast cells in there. It's pretty unbelievable how much, how much yeast is still available. So that's how it's able to carbonate because there's still, there's still yeast in that, in that solution that's able to eat the sugars. Uh, I would stick to the rule, uh, like the 10 day to two week kind of thing. Um, no, usually you want, you don't want to do that because, um, uh, the whole idea of the secondary is to get it off the yeast that is it's sitting on it. Um, if it's still fermenting, a lot of that yeast is still in solution, so you're taking it right over with you. So that it really kind of eliminates the purpose of doing it. I would personally let the beer ferment, let it do its thing, let it slow down and set for you know at least 10 days or so, and then go ahead and transfer it. And that way you're kind of leaving as much yeast behind as you can. That's the whole idea of a secondary fermenter. 
A secondary fermenter also, and that's where I was talking where you, you ferment in here and then you put it in, in something like this before you bottle. Um, a secondary fermenter is a good spot to add fruit if you want to make a fruit beer or dry hopping where you add hops at like, like Two Hearted or you know a big hoppy beer like that. A lot of times they get dry hopped and that's kind of the idea behind that. So um, I hope that makes sense. I don't know. Did you? Uh, you mentioned that you don't want chlorine. Yeah. you want hard water, do you add gypsum or something? It really depends on the beer you're making. Um, we have, we actually have very alkal, we have very alkaline water here in Kalamazoo and in Michigan, I think in general. Um, I find that I add, I usually dilute my water 50-50 with reverse osmosis water that I buy like at Myers. And I find that that's a pretty good mix for kind of getting things not too hard, not too soft sort of thing. Like spring water? Yeah, it's like the, it's like the machine they have at Myers, and you fill up one of those jugs. Um, yeah, it's like reverse osmosis water. It's, it's qu not quite distilled, but it's, got, um, it's pretty close. Uh, adding gypsum is kind of a dip beer by beer. I think it's a recipe by recipe kind of thing. Because if you don't know what you're starting with, we don't have a lot of salt. Uh, gypsum is calcium sulfate. Sulfate enhances bitterness in, in hops. So the more sulfate you have in a beer, the more bitter it might be. Um, if you don't know what you're starting with, then you can go too far pretty quick. If a recipe says, in general, add two teaspoons of gypsum or something like that, well, his whoever wrote that recipe is probably quite a bit different than what we have here. So get to know your water. I think that's another more advanced kind of topic, but um, as you get to know your water, you maybe know which styles you need to do that with. So I think in general, we have pretty good water for most styles, particularly on the darker half of things. I think there's a lot of really good stouts in Michigan <laughs> and porters and dark beers like that. Uh, there's also really good IPAs too. So um, it's, you know, I think those people know their water and they know how to tweak it. So I, th I would, Take good notes. That's another another reason to take good notes. Because yeah. Um, I have a problem like with the bitterness, you know, in, in beer, especially like the stout, two by two stouts. But I definitely like the cider in beer. That uh, that cider is just one of my yep. go to kind of things. But when you were talking about doing a secondary fermentation where you can add the fruit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. In our store, we used to do a recipe of the month. We have a whole book, and we pretty much maxed out the book, so we don't really write them anymore. But we have just about every style you can think of that we had done in there. There's a ton of magazines in our store that you're welcome to thumb through. There's a lot of books that have that are just recipes, and some of them that have a lot of recipes in them that you you know we can help you find. If you come in and tell us just about anything you want, we should be able to find it. The internet's full of stuff, but you never know what you're getting there. A lot of the, the magazines that we carry are pretty reliable, and there's some good books. Some are better than others, but there's some good books to reference for sure. Um, even our website, I think, we used to have kind of a homebrew blog that kind of kind of died off, but it's got some of our recipes of the month on there. And a lot of those were, they'd be this beer, and then if you want to add fruit, do this. You know, it's kind of like a fruit option to, to, if you're interested in something like that, too. So, um, But along the lines of getting involved, the other thing I was talking about, Clob, um, club is, is a big one. They're our local homebrew club. Um, they get discounts in our store off homebrew supplies. If you become a member, it's like 15 bucks a year, I think. It's really cheap and it pays for itself in a couple purchases if you decide to come and, and buy from at our store. Uh, we do demonstrations nearly every month. Uh, I was telling her we're doing one on the 6th, which is uh, the Monday after next. 6 o'clock in our back bar. It's free. There's no charge. We, we we bottle a batch, the batch that we brewed the last time, and we, we brew another batch. So we go through the whole process, and you can hang out with us. You can get a beer, and it's real casual. You can come and go as you like, ask questions. You get uh, free beer, too, at the end. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, get the, you get the brewed beer. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I would say free beer. Yeah, we give the, the beer that we bottled. Uh, Chris, Chris works for me in the store, too, by the way. Uh, the beer that we bottled from the previous, we, we let you guys come up and cap them, and you can take the bottles home. So it's, there is a free, yeah, there is a free beer. Six o'clock on the 6th in our back bar. Um, this, this month is on a Monday. They're typically on Wednesdays, but it kind of depends on what's going on back there. But um, we try to do them about every month or two. And uh, like I said, they're free, and 
we can answer a lot of questions there. Especially, it's nice to kind of see things too. I mean, it's it's pretty much this process, but until you see it, it, it really clicks when you see it. Uh, and the other thing is the AHA, which is what I talked about at the beginning, the American Homebrewers Association. Uh, they're the ones that fight for homebrew rights and keep keep homebrewing legal in all these states and uh, uh, try to you know keep the spirit of homebrewing where it should be. And um, that's another thing worth checking out. They get they have a good publication they put out every two months, which is a nice a nice uh, magazine worth reading. And it's it's worth the the forty bucks right there, I think. Um, but I think I think that's about it. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, that's it. Um, typically, just correct me if I'm wrong, but typically in the winter months, when I was planning on brewing, I keep my, my hops kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, around 62 degrees. Yeah. Or so. That's um, pretty cool. Cheap. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I understand. Uh, and, uh, <coughs> and so it sounds like that's just going to pretty much slow down my process. Yeah. going to be the, the really the only detriment, or is, is it going to? Yeah, having having your fermenter in a 62 degree room is definitely gonna. There are beer styles that would accommodate that, so you could kind of brew around that. Um, there's there's styles of beer that kind of like to ferment somewhere in the middle of an, an ale and a lager, and 62 would be a sweet spot for those. Um, but for your typical ale, it's gonna slow down fermentation so much that you it's gonna really alter the flavor of the beer. Yeah. Yeah, if you could get a if you could get a small space heater or something like that, you know, if you feel safe about leaving that while you're not home, uh, that would probably be a good bet. There's there's a lot of ways. Uh, Homebrewers are pretty creative. They can that you can kind of fashion things together. But a space heater is a good place to start, probably. So. Yeah, something that's fairly small where it's not gonna. Yeah. So it's not running all day. Yep. It blew off the top. Uh, she she was saying she had a her nephew had a fermentation blow the top off. That's actually a good thing. I mean that that's a sign of a good healthy fermentation. It's not good for your rug or whatever it got on, but it definitely a lot of times it, it's it's particularly wheat beers are very good at doing that because wheat has a lot of gluten and it gives a, puts a lot more head on the beer. Uh, strong beers in general, if you make a big you know, something that's going to be maybe nine or ten percent alcohol, those will typically go pretty pretty bonkers too. But that's the reason for headspace. It's it's not a bad idea if you you know in your first day or two to just to keep a close eye on it. If you see it starting to seep up, what I would do is probably just take the lid off the bucket and, and rest it like that, so that if the beer needs to get out, it can. If anybody here has ever been to Arcadia, they I used uh, I worked there quite a long time ago, but they do open fermentation where their fermenters don't have lids on them at all. And they've got paint falling off the ceiling. I mean, it's it's crazy. It's it's like an old age thing, but I mean, it doesn't screw up their beer because there's so much CO2 coming. <sighs> no, they they make wonderful beers, and they, the there's a layer of CO2 that sits on top of the of the fermenter that kind of protects it from everything. So anything that falls in it dies basically, and it's an old it's an old world way of doing things, but it's really interesting. So if if you do have something blow out and you need to kind of let it breathe for a day or so, uh, just Keep the area clean is basically, you know, don't worry about it. It's not going to contaminate because everything's coming out, so it's positive pressure, and that, that's the best thing working for you. Yeah. It's a common thing that happens, especially wheat beers. A lot of people make wheat beers, and that happens. Yes. Yeah, there's there's devices. If you use a carboy, they make blow-off tubes that fit right in the mouth of this, and it can help you run it into a bucket or something like that. It's a little more challenging with, with a bucket because it may just seep down the side, but put some towels and... Yeah, I've come home. I, when I first started brewing, I came home once and there was, it had shot up, and I looked up at the ceiling. And it was a, a spot like that, like a solid spot where it hit. So it's, it gets pretty. Uh, it's usually a, a stout or something real dark because it's going to stain whatever it can. But it's it's bound to happen. So. Any other questions, Chris? Yeah, that's one way. I've had beers that have gone south, and they've get you know if you're if you're good about sanitation, it's usually not an issue. But I have had beers when I was first learning that went sour, 
And your best bet, if your best bet, if you think they're heading sour, is just drink them up before they get too bad. But if you like sour beers, I suppose the, the downside to that is that the bottle, the, you know, if they're in a bottle, they can potentially keep fermenting and explode or something like that. So. They were just like, oh, it's disinfecting with you, like, yes. And they were like, oh, well, you can turn it into a sour beer. Uh, I, I don't think that's a good way. I'd, I would probably cook with it or something like that before I do anything like that. I'm not afraid to dump beer, though. I dump beer probably as much as I drink beer, so. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. If you have any questions, feel free to come up and stop into our store. If you ever, you know, Bell's General Store, we, we've got a whole staff full of homebrewers that are willing to answer your questions, too. So.